All right. Heather Hunter, what's good? Oh, what's going on? First time on Vlad TV. I know. I feel like I'm being, my virginity is being popped right now. <laughs> you know, I'm always giving shout outs. You know, you have guys on the scene, on the streets. And I've got, gave shout outs throughout the time. It's a few years back. All right. But this is nice. I feel good. That's what's up. Let's Welcome. Pop. <laughs> okay. So where did you grow up exactly? I was born in Bronx, raised in Brooklyn and Harlem. Okay. Yeah. And you left home at 16. At 16, yeah. Okay, now what would make a 16-year-old leave her house? Oh my God. Um, I think around that time when I was 16, it, it really was like, I think every 16-year-old woman, I mean, growing in, going into your womanhood, you, you're misunderstood. And I was looking for love, like in all the wrong places, Yeah. as you would say, you know? Even though it was thrilling, you know, but I, I, I literally, found love and it didn't go as as the way I expected, you know? And okay. I think a lot of people, I think when it comes to my um, career, a lot of people think things are glitz and glamour, but a dark place starts when you're, when you get into the game, at least where I got into, at least the okay. X game. So um, um, in the beginning of when I thought something was love, it wasn't, and I was like attacked. So when you when you get to that point, you really go to a point where you want to like control everything that has to do with intimacy, affection, um, love, enticing. And I found myself literally running away into the streets trying to find that type of seduction. So what do you and mean that's by how I got into the game of stripping. Well, so what do you mean by attacked? Um, I was raped. At 16? At 16, yeah. By who? Um, that's how I lost my virginity. Oh, you were raped the first time. Right. So, so, so. Who, who was it? Um, actually, someone that I really, really uh, cared about, you know, that person has passed away now, you know. Um, it's, it's a blessing in disguise, as you would say, you know what I mean? Um, but that took me to a point where you, you kind of go, you get misunderstood with your parents. People don't know really what's going on with you. So your parents find out about it? Uh, yeah. Okay. And yeah. of course, you know, who's going to believe you? So you go. Oh, they didn't believe you? Well, my, my mother at first, she didn't because I was really running the streets. I was working at Land Quarters. I was really out there. And I think when kids, and that's the problem with kids now, teenagers, people assume that they're doing more than what they're doing. And when you get out there and you experience stuff, that's like a killer. So you face what's in those streets, and those streets are not, you know, as sweet and nice as you expect them to be. So when I got into the, when I started working at Latin Quarters, I was really running away. And I was literally staying at a transition hotel, paying for a hotel and working at Latin Quarters okay. to pay for that hotel. And then I decided, I saw an ad in the Village Voice. And back then, you know, you had the ads about stripping and everything. And I was 16 and I was like, okay, maybe I can go do this. And I went out there, I went to strip, and around that time you can get away with a lot of stuff back then, you know. Um, and that was an experience that took me on a journey to where I'm at right now. <laughs> okay, so you know? at 16 you started stripping? Yes. Mm -hmm. What was that like, being a 16 year old, taking your clothes off in front of a bunch of older men and, you know, everything that kind of comes in that type of lifestyle? By the time I got to that level, I was being kind of groomed already. You know, I was really a machine. I became kind of numb to the situation. It was really about me controlling, you know, really getting a, getting a man to that point where I can get you so enticed by me that you're intimidated, if that makes any sense. You okay. Know? Yeah. So you stripped for how long? Oh my God, I, well I, I was a house dancer from 16 to 18. And on my first day of my birthday, I did my first adult film. Okay, so what made you want to do adult film? Um, by that time, you know, this is just so funny because I tell girls now, you know, everybody thinks they're doing something new, especially with the video Vixens. This all had been done before, you know what I mean? There's a root, a beginning of stuff. And what this business does when you go into the erotic game, it designs you to become very robotic. It's like you're going to school. So of course I started dancing, that becomes a big deal. Um, I'm pretty much in that life, and I met Hyapatia Lee 
she was a porn star, and she decided to come over, and she said to me, she was like, you should be featuring, you shouldn't be here, you're, you're, you're not supposed to be here. Um, and she introduced me to this guy, Dave, which was my manager for like 27 years. I love Dave, Dave Copeland. And as soon as I know it, I was signing with uh, this company called Vidway, and it was incredible. Okay. You know, I have to admit, <laughs> it really was. You know, my first movie, I was doing my movie, and after, the, um, after my scenes, after the whole day was over, we were blowing our candles, and I was singing happy birthday, you know? Well, before you did your first porn mm -hmm. scene, um, were you escorting at all while you were stripping and that um, type of thing? Yeah, see. that's in that spectrum, you know what I mean? This whole game has so many different levels, you know? And I don't care what girl is in the game right now. You, you, you have a choice to figure out what you want to do, you know what I mean? But the obstacles are hard to jump, you know, because this business kind of entwines together when it comes down to sex. Either way, you're giving, you're giving up sex to somebody, whether you're getting paid for it or not, <laughs> you know? Um, my gift was is that I wanted to have sex with whoever I wanted to have sex with. That was my gift, you know, and that was my power. So I choose to be whoever I want to choose to. So of course, you know, you have people, of course, it's, you know, with, with uh, stripping, stripping, of course, you have a choice to escort, you know? There's a lot of things that come with that business, porn, it, it, you have a choice. Okay, yeah. so you, you were doing some escorting. Yeah, I did a little escorting, yeah. Okay, and now you did your first scene. And I had no idea how taboo it was. Okay. <laughs> Especially in that era, you know, you're talking about the 80s, the late 80s, I had no idea. You know, I remember I, I did Joan London's show on, uh, uh, yeah, Good Morning America, I think, Joan London's show. And I went on this show and that's when I realized what I was doing was so taboo. And I realized, I was like, oh my God, okay. I'm in it, so let me let it work for me, you know? I'm a businesswoman at the end of the day. I'm, I'm very creative, you know? So I was like, okay, since you're in this business, you're gonna really make a change in this business, at least for the African-American, okay. you know? Because back then it was just, there, there, no there black were no girls. rights, yeah. I mean, there was, before you, there was Ebony A's. Ebony A's, you had Angel Kelly, Nina Zaponka, um, and Vanessa W. But I got into business right when Nina DePonka and um, Angel Kelly was in. Okay. Yeah, and they were just leaving. Yeah. Yeah. So there were just not a lot of black girls, period. No, there was just not. And it was just really so stereotypical. It was, it was, it was a racist business back then. You like know, how? you really had to stand up for your rights. Okay, so racist how? Uh-huh. And the point where everything was very much segregated, let's start off with that. You know, I think I was one of the first people that, um, between me, Angel, and Nina, they really kind of, launch like the interracial to make it to the point where they saw revenue and saw how big that business was. I think when I got into the films and I kind of opened the doors and I stood up for a lot of things that I think other actresses before me didn't feel like they could, or I don't know why, you know, but I think there's a time when you just got to stand up for yourself, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's exactly, I, I wasn't going to be portrayed as, um, black this or I just want to be traded to Heather you know I'm a human being at the end of the day and you know you're laying on your back it's the most intimate moment the most vulnerable experience you can be doing you know so as a human being you don't want to be thinking about color you, you want to be represented for who you are okay yeah now from the, the point that you did that first scene and you know this was like just like a small company essentially or Vidway like yeah I was with Vidway for at least a year, okay, and then I met uh, Stephen Hirsch at Vid Vivid, oh, Vivid, yeah, at my met. first convention, okay, and he scooped me up immediately. <laughs> okay, I love. Stephen. And you were the first uh -huh. black contract girl. Right. What happened after you became a contract girl? Because okay, so for those that don't know, most girls who do porn, they show up, they get paid to do the scene, and then they leave, and then there's no more money until they do the next scene. But a contract girl gets like a salary. I yeah. guess, like a yearly salary. Like a yearly salary. And they determine how many scenes you do during the course of that year, and it's usually not a lot of scenes. No, it's usually like two and a half scenes. Um, the half scene is usually like a solo masturbation, um, but it's two scenes. I do about five or six movies within that year. Um, you have a choice to have your money up front or you know, break it into times that you're working. But they tend to bang out the films so quickly 
that you're free the entire year. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, and, but the benefits, I always say, um, once you're a vivid good girl, you're always a vivid girl. I mean, the benefits that came with being with Vivid was, it was a great experience. I was like in this bubble, it was this magic bubble. Um, I couldn't be touched, you know, I was untouchable. Uh, even to this day, you know, um, the respect that the Vivid girl got was just outstanding, you know. Uh, it was a great company to work for, I, I can't front, <laughs> you know. It really was. Yeah, and, and Stephen, Stephen Hirsch, uh, you know, who I've interviewed before, is like a businessman. He's not just yeah. sitting there trying to fuck as many girls as he can. No, and he really took he took really special interest in me. Yeah. In the sense where even when I wanted to get out the business, he really made it possible. It was like you know he could have lured me back into the business. You know, mm -hmm. he was like, nah, go do do what you got to do. You got your talent. You know, you're creative. You know, I could see you doing so many bigger things. Okay. And he gave me that platform to keep moving. You know. Okay. Yeah. So you were a vivid girl for how long? Uh, for three years, I did a Jay Z. I I, <laughs> I retired. <laughs> I retired like two times, and I came back. You know, my last retirement, um, I think I was like at twenty four, and I was I only worked for like two months, and then I was tired again. Okay. Yeah, and then that's when my whole life just you know I, I had a different plan. Okay. Yeah. What made you want to retire? Um, a lot of things, combination. After I cleared taxes, it was not worth it. You know what I mean? Um, porn was getting into a point where it was becoming action adventure porn. It was becoming Olympics. Like the more you do, you have to out -top, top every performer. The most nastiest stuff you could do, it was gonna win, you know what I mean? And then Vivid was basically traveling a lot off production. And I was more like a studio porn star, you know? I really, I, di I really didn't like the, the new wave, wave it was going into. And then when HIV came to arise, I was immediately wearing condoms. And I just, and I sat back, I was like, this ain't worth it, you know? I got your health, you're not making, to me, it was the, I, I, I wanted more, you could make more money, you know what I mean? After the taxes, it just wasn't worth it, you know, and mostly my health. Well, th th then there was that one male porn star who mm -hmm. faked his test. Mark Wallace? Are you talking about Mark Wallace? Yes. Yes. Mark Wallace was a male, a white male porn yes. star who was HIV positive, yeah. mm -hmm. faked his test, mm -hmm. and infected a few girls. Right. Well, one of them was a black girl named Jordan McKnight. Jordan McKnight. It was a friend of mine. Friend too. of yours. Yes. So, so did you know her? Yeah, when I knew that her. happened? I knew it when it happened. I knew, you know, when she um, actually, you know, she kind of like, you know, left the business and you really didn't hear from her anymore. But yeah, that was, that was sad. My, you know, it, it, it gets to a point, I, you know, I'm older now, I'm 46 years old. So it gets to a point now where you kind of look back on your life and I'm so happy I made the choices that I made. It was really, you know, I pulled out, it's like gambling. I always say when you, and, and I also say it's like going to war, you're like a soldier. You can go into this business and you can come out, either you can come out and die, you can get wounded, you know what I mean? Or you can come out and you can tell your story, you know, as a true soldier. And that's really where I've gotten my life to. I got out just in time, you know? Right. And I try to preach to the girls that, and even the guys, there's so much stuff you could do with your sexuality these days that you don't have to actually go into the adult business and have unprotected sex, you know? There's so many ways to make money now. And if people took more control of their, their lives as their business, you know, when your body, your body is your business. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing right now. You know, you have women. I come from a, it's kind of crazy to me. I come from a world, a generation where your body's your temple. And I believe that. But at the same time, you're not supposed to give things away for free. There has to be some things that you hope for sacred. And this generation, everybody's giving things away for free. So, and then anybody's complaining that they're making, not making money in the business. So if you give it away from free, how are you going to make money? You know what I mean? Right. So to me, it's just, you know, it's all backwards. But you know how this is. It's always backwards. <laughs> you know? So you decided to leave the business. Uh-huh. You started to pursue music, and you actually had a couple record deals. Yeah, I actually had. Um, I was with Island Records. Um, I did a, a song called "I Want It All Night Long." 
that was produced by Smack. That was incredible. Actually, I had Michael Kenneth Williams. He was on tour mm -hmm. with me with another background dancer. So Michael was a background dancer, you know. Um, that's my fan, you know. And it was, that was an amazing experience. Actually, Cookie Gonzalez signed me to Island Records. Mm -hmm. Good man. Very then good. Then you man. had to deal with Tommy Boy, I guess. Tommy Boy, right. And then we got into the Mary J. Blige era, <laughs> you know. I was with Tommy Boy Records, and I think they didn't know what to do with me. I think, you know, and I love Tommy Boy. They were great working with, a great company. But it was trying to figure out what kind of music do we, we do. Do we do R&B? Do we do house? And I really think they should have had me in hip hop at that time. Okay, so you get into music. Mm -hmm. You're you're doing it seriously, but then there's the stigma of, well, that's the porn star who's trying to do music. And and over the years, there's been a bunch of porn people that are trying to do music. I think mm -hmm. India has you know right. done music. You know Jake Steed, mm -hmm. <laughs> you right. know would rap in the you know before his pornos, and mm -hmm. you know I mean there, there's been a, you know. <laughs> Fast forward to Brian Pumper trying to do music and everything else like that. Yeah, so, so Brian. how much, you know, how hard was it to have people take you seriously because of the porn background? Actually, it was not hard at all. Hmm. It really wasn't. You know, I think media can make it hard in, in what they write. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But in reality, it wasn't hard because I, I come from back to the porn world. When I left from doing movies, I went back to the streets. I went back to LQ, Latin quarters. I was around all my colleagues that are actually all successful entertainers today. You know, I'm in a club and I'm, I'm dancing with everybody between salt, pepper, all everybody. You can imagine Latin quarters, mm -hmm. you know? So that place birthed like amazing hip hop artists and DJs. So of working there, that close net, People really wanted to see me do something different. So when I got into the adult industry, people were really shocked, you know. And when I decided to come back and start working on my talents, you know, my creative interests, they took me serious because they really didn't want to see me go back into the business, you know okay. what I mean? So I had a really great deal of support. And then when I did a record for Item Records, I actually hit the Billboard charts. So, I, you know, I really kind of, everything I, I, I kind of, was putting out there. I was just, until this day, I just create because I, I can't stop creating, you know what I mean? And I just, I'm happy if just one, two people love it, but you know, you know, if you're a creator, you have to put it out in the world. It just, you'll, you'll, you'll bust, you yeah. know what I mean? And you worked with a lot of notable people. Yes. Um, you worked with Scott Storch. Yeah, on my, actually that's, that's the album, the Double H Unexpected, I put that out myself. DJ um, Premier? Right, DJ Premier. Right. Uh, Akinelli? Akinelli, Noriega, Timberland. Timberland? Uh huh, Bubba Sparks, um, Cool Keith, mm -hmm. uh, Above the Law. Mm. Um, God, there's so many other people. Bootsy Collins, I, you know, back when, you know, the video Vixen, you know, you're a video, you know, it's one of those video girls um, back then with Big Daddy Kane, you know, Mike Geromno. So it was a lot of stuff that I was jumping into. You know, and yeah. Out of all those, like, who do you think you had the, the the best kind of musical musical connection with? Believe it or not, I would say it's a combination because I loved working with Timbaland and, and Scott. You know, um, you know, Scott is talented. He's a knucklehead, but he's talented. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I just interviewed Scott actually at his yeah, house in, in LA. He's a yeah. knucklehead. He don't want me to say what I want to say, you know. Well, <laughs> Scott, Scott, but trust me. But you know, um, it's more or less. I say working. That was an honor to work with Timberland. You know, to actually be on a project with him, Bubba Sparks and Scott. Uh, DJ Premier was amazing. You know, uh, for him to actually produce a beat for me, that was really nice. Um, it's, it's, it's the love. These are all my people. So, you know, it's hard to say who was the best because when you're going through that experience, you're just happy you're blessed that you're there, you know, to work with these great people. It's yeah. really hard. Akinali would definitely mentor me. He made me into double H. I have to get that, you know? Yeah. He made me embody between him and Luke Campbell, you know, ah. Uncle, Luke, Uncle Luke, you know, between Ak and Uncle Luke, we toured, you know, for at least about two, two years off and on with, with Luke. And that was crazy. 
But a lot of the people that you that you mention, uh -huh. like their music kind of would intermingle with sex and, and that type of thing. Right. You know, Akinelli, mm -hmm. you know, his big hit is Put It In Your Mouth. Yes. You know, Luke, his whole career was based on sex and booty shaking mm -hmm. and, and everything else like that. Um, you know, was it always just music or was there more of a, you know, a sexual thing going on with some of the people you worked with? No, it was just music. Um, I used to, uh, I mean, back I used to date Scott, but that was before music, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, uh, anybody had to go through that list? No, that was it. <laughs> had to go through that list of those people. <laughs> yeah. Um, just Scott. Yes, just Scott. Um, I think when it comes to sexuality, you know, because I call myself a domestic freak. I'm very conservative. Bill Maher, Bill Maher, he calls me a conservative freak, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, you know, it's things that, you know, I'm the kind of person that I have to still express my sexuality because I can't help it. It's part of me, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm going to surround myself with people who, who think the same as I do. So when I was on that tour, I was enjoying myself, you know, musically. Which, and, which tour? Um, with Ak. Well, me and Ak went on tour for like two years. Really? And, I, you know, we sometimes connect with Uncle Luke, Mystical. It was just crazy. We had like about 10, 15 strippers. We had two vans. We would just, we did, I did what they call the, the, the underground, like every underground place. It was at the point they were calling me Latoya Jackson. <laughs> they were shocked that I was there. Yeah. And we were doing like, you know, I was doing everything that uh, any MC had to do. It was the boot camp of getting into the, into the you know that, that world to really know what it is to be MC because to me when I was when I put out those albums at least put out my hip hop album it was really like a homage because mm -hmm. I love hip hop it's part of me it's in my blood yeah. nobody can take the history out of me you know I understand that mindset because I like have that like because you don't believe in somebody so much you just joke on them like I'm gonna joke on you I don't believe you mm -hmm. so I understand it but you know. I want hip hop, period, like, yeah. to stop the shenanigans with that type of shit. Like, yo, motherfucker, rap, go rap. My monthly uh, overhead for my household and employee, just household employees, was somewhere in the neighborhood of like a million dollars a month I was spending. 